At one point, your club had over 100 competitors, but over the last few years, it has started to decline. And just within the last three years, you went from 75 competitors to, to about 30 this upcoming season. Now, partly it's because of you know, competing interests of different sports in your community. And the other thing is, is we're dealing with COVID. And as you can appreciate, um, when you can't actually swim or compete, the, um, the interests wane a little bit. So that's why you're not seeing as many people registering for, your, for the clubs. And your club's only offering sweet swimming. You're not offering the other aquatic disciplines like water polo, uh, um, artistic, and uh, diving. And like I said earlier, um, you know, because of the decline in the number of participants, your competitiveness within the region and provincial uh, championships has been declining over the last three years. And your club has also been having a difficult time fighting qualified coaches. And because of all the thing that's going on, both in terms of the declining number of participants and COVID, your club executive is very concerned about the financial outlook over the next couple of years. And there's also a competing interest within your region where, or within your area, uh, your club, where you compete against is that there is also a winter club. And, and because of that, and because they promote themselves quite regularly and quite broadly, um, to a certain degree, the, winter, the summer club takes a back seat to the winter club, okay? So that's the scenario and in the, in the, in the picture and the framing that I want you to think about as we move forward with my presentation. And like I said, you know, if you have any question, um, you know, put your, thinking cap on and, uh, and as we move forward, okay? So what is a strategy? Um, a strategy is really a integrated set of uh, choices that are made by organization to capture the essence of what and how it believes it will be successful in the future. I think all of you have different, developed different strategies. Essentially, what we wanna do is tie together all those strategies together to create a, a comprehensive and integrated plan. So, you know, based on scenarios, um, you know, you have to ask yourself, is it time for a change? I think it is based on, you know, the pictures that I have put forward. Then what do you need to do to be able to be successful in the future? You need to think about what objectives, what tactics, what goals you want to achieve to allow for you to be successful in the next few years. And who's gonna be involved? Is it gonna be the executives, the coaches, the memberships, the competitors, um, other stakeholders outside of the organization? Um, do you need to start lobbying um, to the local governments for better relationship and getting the pool time necessary to support your clubs? Do you need to talk to uh, the local newspaper to get a higher profile for your clubs? Uh, you know, that type of things. And then how do you deliver after you have set the goals um, and how to be sustainable? It's one thing of, you know, setting the goals. It's one thing to have maybe, you know, short-term funding for, to achieve the goals and the resources to achieve your goal. But what about the long-term? How are you gonna sustain you know, having those resources to support your programs and your goals, not this year, but next year and the following year. So that's very important. And how well are we set up in positions for the future? Do we have the infrastructure, the membership, uh, the relationship and the partnerships for you to be successful over the next few years after you have set the plan? And how do you execute the plan? Uh, and what are the obstacles? Um, that's going to be facing you. Is the local government going to be shutting down one of the outdoor pool? That happens and it's becoming more and more of a trend because running an outdoor pool is very expensive. And there's no community out there that I, I know, except maybe Town Solani just recently, built an outdoor pool 
because you're just not getting the best bang for the buck with having just running an outdoor pool for a few months out of the year. You need the indoor pool. And if you're relying, if your club, you know, practice and compete in outdoor pool and they plan to shut it down in the next few years, then what? What are you going to do? Um, what need to change in what ways? Uh, you can't do everything all at once. It's just too much. You know, you're going to be thinking about all these objectives, all these goals, all these tactics. Uh, those are great. But one thing I have to say, and this is very important, is that you have to manage the expectation. You can't do everything all at once. You, need to have, you have to prioritize and focus on what's the most critical, important things and goals you need to do for the next three or four years. And then what's to come next? Uh, there are going to be some goals, objectives that you have come and think about that you may not be able to achieve, perhaps within this you know, strategic planning cycle within the next three, four years, but something to keep in mind beyond the three year, four years time frame, And that's very important too, to keep that outlook focus. And again, to tie it all together, uh, how will you make the necessary changes? Again, what do you have? What kind of infrastructures do you have? What kind of resources do you have? What kind of obstacles are you gonna be facing? All of that needs to be taken into consideration for you to be able to make those necessary changes. So there's an old saying, and really that's what strategic plan is all about, that if you don't know where you're going, you're never gonna get there. So in essence, that's what a strategic plan is all about. It allows you to set the strategy, it charts the way. You know, for me, I'm a pilot, uh, you know, recreationally. For me, I, when I, whenever I fly anywhere, I need to set the chart, set the course. I have to know the bearing, I have to know the track, I have to know the ground speed. Uh, you know, if there's a, you know, high wind, that's gonna throw me off course. I need to be able to calculate how do I adjust the bear, my bearing my, to get to my, the true track. So that's what strategic planning is all about, is to set that vision and set that target for you to get to your de destination, recognizing that there are going to be, you know, wind or wave that may knock you off course, you know, as we move forward to get to where we want to go. But you, you can adjust yourself because you have planned for it. And you can deal with those challenges and issues as you journey through uh, to get to your destination. What are some of the make and break issue that we sort of, you know, discuss? What are the critical resources that you need? And what are some of the resources that you can sort of, you know, slack a little bit? And really it frames the action because it really lays out the key focus, key priorities areas, then it gets down to the goals and tactics. Again, it managed the expectation. And again, for me, you might line of work, it protects staff because as you can appreciate, um, members of council, there's all these ideas that they have that they come across, uh, whether it's from the community or from you know, the constituency, or you know, they just, when they went to a conference and hear this, the next greatest thing, right? And they come back and say, Francis, can we do this? Can we do this? Well, my, always, my response is always gonna be like, okay, we have a strategic plan. We have all the key priority areas. We have all the goals that are laid out, both in terms of with the next four years. We can do what you ask us to do, but there's a choice to be made. We can either do what you ask us to do, but recognizing that we have to remove some of the strategies within our strategic plan to allow us to do what we, you want us to do. Or we stay true to our strategic plan and maybe this idea that you have could be included in the next strategic plan. So it really protects us from being sidetracked on the next great things. Uh, so it helps us that way. And it's a great communication tool and a selling tool. Uh, once you have a strategic plan in place, you can go to your local council, say, mayor, council members, we have a clear, concise, well laid out strategic plan with key priority areas and key goals. And this goal here is to promote this. And we would like your support to maintain and keep the pool open 
for the foreseeable future because we have these great things that is community building, great for the kids, great for those competitors. And we actually need more funding for you to consider improving your pool, like you know a new starting block or a new uh, bleachers to allow to attract more competitors and their families to come and enjoy the swimming. And you can actually give it to even uh, provincial ministers, uh, the minister of sports or whoever. Again, to lay out that, you know, we want via sports to help support BCSSA. You know, we want, uh, because we have such a great strategic plan that we want to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, be equivalent to the winter, uh, to, you know, uh, swim BC. So those are the things that you can use. And not only that, you can actually go out to your newspaper and use some of those strategic actions to help sell and communicate your vision for the club and where you see your club's gonna be in the next year, two years, four years, and years beyond that. And really a strategic, strategic plans keep everybody focused and committed to those key areas of priorities and goals. Um, again, like I said earlier, because there is always the next greatest thing and you're gonna get sidetracked if you don't commit yourself. And by committing yourself, it also means that the board or the executives of the, of the club needs to put in the resources, whether it's financial or coaches or sending you like today to the coaches conference to get to educate and learn the next new, you know, um, greatest um, coaching methods to teach the competitors uh, nutritional uh, training and all that stuff. And it is also a vehicle for managing change. Like I said earlier, uh, you know, it's very tough to ch make people change, but having a strong vision, a mission, priorities areas, goals, you can communicate that to the membership and to others that we're looking at changing the culture of the organize of the clubs, uh, changing the way how we do things. And this is how we're going to do it by following this, 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 and this. You can lay it out, and it's a great communication tool for you to do so. In any strategic plan, really what it comes down to is getting us to have a shared vision of where we want to go. Um, the vision statement is really the destination. And then you got key activities. It's really the legs of the journey. It's how you get there. Um, and then the enablers is what will make the journey possible. And the measure of success is how will we know when we get got there? And I'll get to that a little bit later as uh, in my presentation, how to structure those vision activities, enablers, and key measure of success. You know, I'm facing this right now with my, my work, dealing with change. We have a strategic plan, obviously, uh, in, in the city. And because of COVID, it turned our world upside down. So what we need to do is we need to adjust and adapt to deal with what we need to do facing the community and the needs and demands of the community. So a strategic plan even is a living document. And, and um, continue process, we need to look at what needs to be changed. Uh, like right now, instead of some of the things that we have, you know, looked towards of doing, we have to actually stop because, you know, the business owner is not gonna care, um, you know, what, we, what the city is gonna do to um, clean the street per se or upgrade the street. All they care about is how to stay afloat, how to keep the business running during the pandemic. They're looking for the city and the governments to what we can do to help them stay, stay really stay afloat and stay alive. So we need to change course in terms of how we're gonna do that. But, you know, and some of the things that we, we, you know, we can't do what we were planning on doing. Like one of the things that we were planning on because we're looking at the arrival of the SkyTrain coming to Langley City, we're looking at borrowing, you know, $50 million to help us invest in a number of things. Well, we had to put a, a stop to that, partly because you know, that would mean a taxation increase to the community. And the other thing is, like I said earlier, um, the residents and the, and the business owner are not gonna care at this point about, you know, the city borrowing the $50 million. 
we're going to have a revolt on our hand. So we have to change course because of that. Um, and by having a strategic plan, we're being proactive instead of reactive because we have to, all the areas of the parties all laid out. So why establish parties? Essentially, is for the executives, for the membership of the clubs, the coaches, so that they have a clear mandate to keep them focused and deliver the strategic plan in an inclusive, effective manner. Um, and, you know, for the competitive programs as well for the club. By having a strategic priorities, uh, you can then allocate resources and to maximize the resources where it's necessary because you can put those resources in those areas. Like I said, there is somewhere, you know, you wanna, you know, need to max, uh, optimize. There's some that you can put a slack uh, by having a strategic plan where those key priorities areas are. You can sink in those resources to where you think are the most needed and sort of reallocate the others that you don't, you know, that are less of a priority. Um, again, those priorities are, are, it's a great tool for you to communicate with your membership, coaches, swimmers, and the broader community. And it ties the goals with the, your club's vision, mission, and values. And by having the, the goals set in place, it makes the executives accountable so that the membership, um, the coaches, the community can hold your executives accountable in terms of what they said they will deliver um, as part of the strategic plan. So a lot of people always ask, what's the difference between a strategic plan and an annual operating plan? I think before strategic plan came along, um, that was probably about 10, 15 years ago. I know when I first started uh, my career in, in local governments, council will always sit down at the begin, beginning of each year or the end of the year, whatever fits. They would sit down with senior staff and they would go around the table and said, okay, what do we wanna achieve next year? And you know, they will come up with maybe 10, 15 uh, goals they want to achieve for the next year. And then staff would then take, take that into account. And then uh, we would plan it out. When we're going to do all those goals? What kind of budget do we need? Then we plan, put it into the budget uh, and so on and so forth. But in a lot of ways, um, that's very short-sighted because that's only dealing with what's in front of you what's the upcoming year? We're not taking a longer view of what could potentially happen down the pipe and what's your long-term vision for the community? Maybe not this year, but what do you need to plan to see? What do you need to start strategizing and start building that will take more than the next year? It may take two, three, four years, or maybe longer than that. For, for us, we have been trying to get the sky train to Langley City for the last decade. So we have been working over the last decade to build ourselves to a position where we could actually accommodate the need, the, all the infrastructures, all the needs that we need when the SkyTrain does arrive. So that's the type of vision you need uh, as opposed to just setting, okay, well, I got the goals for next year, we're gonna do it, and then what? Um, so that's, how it would differentiate between a strategic plan is the long-term vision and as opposed to just the annual plan. Um, and we'll get to that a little bit more later um, as we go through the presentation. So this is a very high level of what a strategic planning process look like. Now you'll see the arrow going one way, uh, but in actual fact, I'm not skilled enough to have the graphics to go have arrow go both ways. Otherwise I would have the arrows going both ways, but this is just a simplistic form of uh, what a, the planning process looks like. Um, is identify your strategic positions, gather people for information, perform SWOT analysis, 
formulate a strategic plan, execute your strategic plan, and constantly monitor performance. I'll get into each one more in depth as, as uh, I go along here. So identify your strategic position. That's really the first stage of the planning process. You need to set out and define what your short-term short -term and long-term objectives are. What do you hope to achieve? And what steps are you gonna take to achieve those objectives? And you have to remember that, you know, it's great to have these goals, but it, those goals cannot be so lofty that it can't be attainable or achievable. Otherwise, uh, it's no point having those goals if you can't achieve them. It has to be realistic too, and you can, it has to be measurable so you can demonstrate the progress to your board, to your membership, to your coaches, to all the stakeholders. And you always have to reflect back to your vision, missions, and your values when you're developing your short-term and uh, long-term objectives. I've, here are the parts of uh, the vision, mission, and core values and strategic priorities of within a strategic plan. The vision statement is something to be pursued. And a mission statement is how to get there, what needs to be accomplished. And I'll go back to the vision bef before I, I go on. I, within a vision statement, you want to ask yourself what the club will be like when the goals of the club's strategic priorities are achieved. What we want our club to ultimately become or achieve. Okay, a mission statement, like I said earlier, is how do we get there and what needs to be done? And what's this purpose? What we need to do as an organization over the next relevant time frame in order to move forward achieving your vision. Core values are your beliefs and principles that guides the club's memberships, coaches, and athletes. Values have the potential to guide people's behavior, align the club's way of doing things, and provide a screen for recruiting people into the organization. It defines and maintains an organizational culture. And the key results areas, you can call us strategic priorities or key results areas, they're interchangeable. Uh, are the priorities expressed from the engagement and the desired results to be achieved in support of the vision, mission, and core values. So here's a couple of examples of a vision. A vision, like I said earlier, is what do you see ourselves in the next four years and beyond? For BCSSA, it wants to be a leading sport organization, fostering a culture of inclusiveness, fun, and achievement. And for Fort Canoe and Kayak Club, uh, to be recognized in BC as an influential and dominant sprint canoe kayak club with a culture of inclusiveness, fun, and achievement. So some of the key words are, are there. And as you develop your strategic plan, especially with the vision and mission and values, um, you're gonna do a lot of wordsmithing. And, and to be quite honest, uh, defining your goals and object objectives are the easy part. You will spend the majority of your time wordsmithing your vision, mission statement, and your core values. Uh, because, you know, for BCSSA, is, the vision is very short and that's the way it should be. So every word means something. Now, there are some organizations uh, and clubs that have like paragraphs of vision and mission statement. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think that get lost, you, you know, when you start promoting your club and, you know, you don't, you know, for Langley City, our vision is the place to be. So people remember that. Um, and it's not long, it's only like, you know, the place to be is four words even really three words, to be very honest. 
um, people will start remembering and, and recognizing when people say, oh, you know, what's like say the Lamy? Oh, it's the place to be. So that's what we're trying to get to. So mission statement is what do we do? Who do we do it for? And how and, and why we do, do we do? So for BCSSA is to promote and encourage the development of athletes and volunteers through participation in speed swimming, diving, water polo, and now it's artistic swimming, not synchronized anymore. It was changed a year and a bit ago. And for Fort Canoe Kayak Club, we're committed to promoting and developing the sports of sprint canoe kayak by encouraging participants growth and personal success through the offering of exciting and diverse programs and cultivating a passion for the sports within the community. That's quite a mouthful, uh, but that's what the mission statement uh, was when they were thinking about that. Core values uh, reflect the core ideology of the club, the deeply held values that do not change over time and answer the questions, how do we carry out our mission? Values are what the clubs lives, breathes, and reflects in all of his activities. For BCSSA, it is through his members, member clubs. BCSSA provides opportunities for training, comp competition, and activities in communities throughout BC and surrounding areas. BCSSA promotes the development of the individual's capacity to achieve excellence and life skills through participation in competitive aquatic activities. Whereas in the Fort Lanny Canoe, Canoe Club, it's, it's just a club as opposed to BCSA, where it represents the entire province and 64 clubs uh, throughout the, the province. So it's quite short and sustained. It's community, safety, excellence, and sustainability. So the next stage of the planning process is um, gathering people for information. Um, now you have the internal uh, stakeholders, which are the executive members, membership of your clubs, coaches, athletes. Uh, for external, you may have BCSSA, um, city, um, other stakeholders. What you want to do is there are a lot of information out there. And the more information you have, the better you're able to develop your objectives, your goals, and your tactics. As I alluded earlier, um, you know, the city may be thinking about, you know, decommissioning the outdoor pool in five years time. That's a key information that you need to know as you move forward. Uh, or the city is looking at um, developing a new indoor pool. So the question then is, you know, you want to get to be represented within the, the perhaps the building committee of the new indoor, indoor pool. So that one, you can build the partnership, you can build the relationship, but more importantly, you may be able to influence of how the pool is going to be built. I can tell you, um, you know, I was asked uh, by the township of Langley when, when they were building the Alder Grove pool, not because I was, uh, well, partly because I was um, associated with BCSA, uh, but also because of my positions. And I told them what needs to be built. Uh, unfortunately, they only built uh, a four lane pool. Uh, you can't really have a true swim meet there. The deck space are not adequate for swim meet. Uh, so those are the things um, that you want to be part of and be associated with. Um, so you need that intelligence. You need that information. Um, you want to have that relationship, say, perhaps with via sports in terms of what they're thinking down the pipe. And how can you influence uh, yourself? Uh, maybe not at the club level, perhaps, but, you know, certainly with, you know, different things. Um, not only with the city, but there might be other organization and cross training opportunities that you may have with different stakeholders in your community. Um, 
you may be able to, you know, um, perhaps partner with the city and maybe I have to, you know, help the city train some of the programs out there. Who knows, right? So you need to be, you need to be attuned to that. Um, or the other thing is uh, the city may be increasing the, the pool fees just to keep them afloat. And if that's the case, how is that going to affect your membership? How is that going to affect your fees that you need to get have your members pay to be registered for your club? So those are all the information that you, you need to have, know going into it. And I think the cr critical part is performing a SWOT, an SWOT analysis. I think many of you know what this means. It's uh, strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. Um, it helps you identify your strengths, the strengths and weaknesses of your clubs or your organization, and also identify any opportunities and threats that are facing the clubs in the upcoming years. Once you have identified your you know, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, then you can start looking at those objectives uh, that will help you face what's coming uh, in a positive way because you know what they are, you have identified what they are. It will lead you to the right direction and get, guide you towards the to successful goals. And once you have those objectives, and I'm gonna get to a, bit late, a little bit later in terms of defining the key priorities. And I would say that in, how, in the hierarchy of how you define the key priorities, for the most part, you're probably gonna be defining those key objectives and, and goals first. Once you have a set of say, you know, 80 goals out there, then you can start massaging those goals into certain themes, if you will, or different priorities. And then you can then start aligning those key priorities with the goals and objectives that you have created. And again, you know, that needs some massaging and you need to define the priorities. Some you can do fairly quickly, some uh, more higher priority than others. Again, you need to manage the expectation. Don't, don't overcommit yourself because you want the plan to be achievable, attainable, and successful. You don't want a plan that's the opposite, where it's not achievable, it's not measurable, it's not successful. Then it's just going to be sitting in your, on your, in your shelf uh, collecting dust. You don't want that to happen either. Once you have the, performed the SWOT analysis, then again, you got, like, like I said earlier, you can then start developing and formulating your strategic plan. Uh, as I said earlier, you can then formulate the key priorities or the strategies, if you will. And then you can then start developing uh, the tactics underneath each of the key areas, strategic priorities. Now, like I said earlier, you want to use what I call the uh, SMART acronym. And what I mean by a SMART acronym is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. So with specific is who is involved? What do I want to accomplish? Where, where will it be done? Why am I doing this? What are the reasons and purpose? What are the constraints or requirements do I have? With measurable, can you track the progress and measure the outcome? How much, how many, how I know when my goal is accomplished? Attainable. Is the goal reasonable enough to be accomplished? How so? You want to make sure the goal is not out of reach or below the standard performance. Relevant. Is the goal worthwhile and will it meet your needs? Is each goal consistent with the other goals you have established and fits, your man, and fits with your immediate and long-term plans? Timely. Your objectives should include a time limit. It will establish a sense of urgency and prompt you to have a better time management. In terms of strategic priorities, 
it expressed from the stakeholders engagement, which I saw a little earlier, is important for the executives to understand that they have the responsibility to provide the resources and conditions to allow members, coaches, and athletes to achieve the club's priorities and goals. There's no point having priorities when you don't have those infrastructures and the support in place because it will ultimately fail. Uh, that's why you need the support from top down. An important planning process in setting priorities is defining the long-term goals required to move the clubs towards the club's vision. Again, it's, it's like a full circle. You always have to circle back when you start, when you develop your goals, objectives, and priorities. Always reflect back of what your vision and missions and core values are that will guide you on setting those goals. And it allows for effective long-term goal settings so that your sectors will able to accomplish the inten their intentions over time, like putting the appropriate resources in place, um, the infrastructure in place, and seeking out support where they need to seek the support to allow the club to excel uh, at all levels. And I, like I said earlier, it's not unusual to have, you know, long-term and short-term goals overlapping each other because many of them all do overlaps each other. Um, but the challenge is determining what should be done in what order, by whom, and when. Uh, those are the key ingredients of how you can keep your, your priorities intact. And I sort of said this earlier, um, you know, what are the questions that you need to consider when you're developing the priorities? What is the main purpose of the, of the priority? What are the main objectives in this? Um, who is the priority intended to serve? Executives, members, coaches? Athletes, others? What social, economic, political environment or other factors need to be considered prior to implementation? Like I said earlier, um, you can, you know, not that we could predict a, uh, you know, COVID-19 pandemic, but, you know, perhaps now that we have seen the whole world turn upside down because of it uh, and the global, you know, social issues, um, what do you need to look for? Um, political environment, you know, are you going to have a parks and recs friendly council, city council or provincial government or federal government that will help support amateur sports, amateur local sports, um, or are you going to have uh, a council that's less supportive where they're looking for reducing costs to the, to the city? You know, one council may come in and say, we want a 0% tax increase. What would the, the, the bureaucrats do when they hear, you know, they want a 0% tax increase? The first thing they will do is look where to start trimming and cutting. One thing cutting trimming, as outrageous as it may be, is to perhaps shut down the pool. Or the, the other way is um, outsourcing. You know, there are some communities where um, the recreation facilities are outsourced to a private um, um, company. Are you going to say getting the same quality and of care of the facility as opposed to uh, you know in-house recreational staff? That's debatable, uh, but you know those are some of the things that needs to be considered, right? Uh, as you as you move forward. And does your club have the legal authority to implement this initiative? Um, you may, may not. Uh, so that's something to consider. So with BCSSA, uh, there are four strategic priorities. The first one is organizational development and is to invest in an organization, people and process while ensuring financial sustainability. Priority two is community building, is develop and grow a culture of citizenship, strong ethics, commitment, dedication, and volunteerism. Priority three, achievement, 
strive for accomplishment and competitiveness of individuals, clubs, and regions within a welcoming, inclusive, fun, and family environment. Priority four, partnership. Strengthen our profile, identity, influence, and relationship with, a, with the broader community. Now, you know, I think these are fairly common in terms of uh, trickling down, it could trickle down to the, to the club level, uh, even though this is the, the representative BCSC. But I think each club could draw from these priorities as well to a, to a large degree. In terms of goals and initiative, in terms of hierarchy, you have the strategic priorities and the next level down are the goals and the initiatives. And like I said earlier, um, I'm not gonna read through them again, is the acronym SMART. Specific, measurable, obtainable, relevant, and timely. Execute the, your strategic plan. So just have an example for you here uh, from the BCSSA strategic plan is priority one, organizational development. Initiative three is to enhance communication between the board of directors, the provincial office and the membership. So the tactics to achieve this initiative, there are five. One is to create an annual calendar documenting key events, deadlines, and membership communication. Then we, have, we, have, we identify who's gonna take the lead in actually making sure these tactics can be delivered and on time is the provincial office. And when do we need to complete this tactic? We set, put down 2016. So you, can, you have to do that with every single tactics. Again, it identifies what the tactics is, who's gonna do it, and when it's gonna be done. It keeps us all accountable at every level. And I would also add, even though there is tactics here, there's another level that you need to think about. Because even though we have now set the hierarchy in terms of the priorities, uh, initiatives and tactics, in many ways, these are just statements. You have to get down to the minutia. You need to get down to the nuts and bolts. What I mean by that is the next step is you have to develop your business plan. By having a business plan, what it means is that you have to get down to, like I said, the nuts and bolts, the details of what needs to be done for you to achieve that tactic. Who's gonna be involved? How many people do you need? What kind of budget do I need? How am I gonna get the budget? Do I have operating budget or is it a capital budget? How are you gonna achieve that? Um, who do I need to get the support from? Do I need the support from just the coaches or the membership, the board or the, the BCSSA? So you have to get down to the, to the fine grain of developing your business plan to achieve each one of these tactics. And constantly monitoring. That's, if not anything, is one of the key because the whole entire process is not gonna be effective unless everyone is doing their part. And you have to constantly monitoring and manage the performance and you may need to tweak any components that are not working or leading to what you desire to be. And again, by having constantly monitoring performance, you will make the person in, in charge of that tactics accountable for their assigned, assigned task. And you follow up, you, you know, sometimes you have to do it, you know, respectfully and tactically but sometimes you do have to remind people, you know, this uh, tactic is uh, overdue and, you know, what's your status? And are we, can we get update at the next meeting? Uh, 
to find out where that's at and are there any constraint that you're facing that may or may not allow you to actually accomplish the goal do you need more help do you need more, more, more resources or has the environment or whether it's social economic uh what have you um have now make this tactic not achievable anymore and if that's the case then you can pivot and we focus and say we need to just shelf this tactic and move on to the next one so that's why you need to constantly monitoring your performance and here's a how we've you know performance matrix um, in keeping us on track and monitoring the results. This is just an expansion of the previous slide that I, I, I have shown on screen. It's the same um, tactic. So for example, the first one about documenting key events, deadlines, and membership communication, uh, the measurable outcome is continue adding to the calendar potential to post online and color code for specific roles. Now we're we're dating ourselves now. Disa was was the previous previous provincial office manager, and that was her job to update the Google Calendar and explore options and stuff like that. And that status update is ongoing because there's going to be changes all, all the time. So her job is to keep on making those updates on on the calendar. Um, as you can see in some of the other tactics below, some are completed, some are substantially completed, and some are, you know, in progress. So, you know, it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, there are programs out there where it ties software packages, where it ties all your vision, mission, key results area, you know, goals, tactics, and so on and so forth. Uh, sometimes it feels like, you know, the primary job is actually maintaining that package, not actually focus on what you need to do to ensure your goals are, uh, and objectives are being implemented. So for many of us, um, you know, like at the club level or at the board level, I think a simple spreadsheet will do. Um, and it's probably the easiest form to keep us up to date. Now, if you're, you know, uh, well attuned to that type of uh, software and, and package and you have the resources and the means to do so and you want to be you know for thinking and you want to actually have purchase a uh, that type of package you know by all means um go for it but for the purpose of what we were doing uh it was just as simple as um uh, excel spreadsheet um you can use different form it's just whatever makes you feel comfortable that you can keep track of your performance. And that's really the key. Doesn't matter what tools and what format you have, what, what format you use, the key is to keep track and make us accountable. Okay. So here's what a strategic planning process may look like. Now, don't take this, this is not cast in stone, okay? This is something that uh, you may want to consider and think about uh, when you develop your strategic plan. It's a two days process. You may not to, not need the full two days, um, but here's what, what potentially could look like. Here's day one. Here's the agenda for, for the day one. So you come in, you introduce introductions. Um, I don't know how many people are, are familiar with the strategic planning process. If people are not familiar with the strategic planning process, you may do a little you know mini strategic planning 101. And what's strategic planning? Similar to what I presented, but maybe you know, you know, less you know uh, detailed format. And then you may want to develop a small group dis discussions with Zoom. You may have a breakout room or a chat room. Uh, you can have three or four of them, depending on how many people you have. If you have a, a small group of people, say you know, I think a small group is good to have maybe four or five people maximum to have that small group. Uh, but if it's just your executive board, you can just have your executive, executive board as a small group. You don't need to break, break them out. The first question you ask is the need for change. Do you need to make changes? If so, why? And if not, why not? And what type of change are you contemplating? Then you report back out to the main group and what, what you just discussed. 
and then you have a discussion um, and then start thinking about, you know, how you can reframe what you just discussed into a strategic planning context. And then you could break out again to a small group, into your small groups, and then conduct a SWOT analysis. Then you report back to the main group on the SWOT analysis. And based on your SWOT analysis, you want to identify what are those key objectives, obstacles, strengths, weaknesses, and things like that. Then based on that, you can probably start developing what are some of the goals and tactics uh, to the fine grain. And within that, you can start developing actually and, and actually identifying what are some of the goals and tactics and things into certain themes. And then you can identify, like I said, probably no more than four or five of those key themes or strategic priorities based on uh, all the goals and tactics and, and from your SWOT analysis. And then you go back to your small group again and look at all those top five strategic priorities and look at what options, what can be done to achieve those. Then that will actually help you refine the key goals and tactics that you sort of you know, thought about from your SWOT, SWOT analysis. Then you report back and sort of crystallize from your group what those key five strategic issues are. Now, there could be some common strategic ones. There may be other ones. Um, and that's when you sort of, again, trying to optimize and, and, and crystallize what those five priorities are. So that will probably take you to the end of day one. Day two, you sort of have a, you know, overview of what transpired from day one. And then you want to break out to a small group again and sort of identify some of the potential barriers and to implement implementation and solution based on the threats from the SWOT analysis and others that you could you may think about. And then you report back to the main group. Then you want to pause a little bit. And then based on what you have heard from the first day and what you have thought about from the from the, the you know the earlier small group discussion and reporting back out, start developing first round uh, your vision, mission, and values. Because at that point, you have a better understanding of, you know, based on your SWOT analysis, what your clubs really want to be based on what you just have, all the homework that you have done. And then you can then again, uh, solidify some of the key objectives and strategies um, based on that. And then you wanna go back, have round two. And that's when you are really gonna be wordsmithing. Uh, and I think between the, the round one and round two, vision, mission and values, that would take the majority of, well, from my experience, that would take the majority of, of the day of trying to wordsmith it, unless you have a lot of people who's very good with words and, and things, uh, because you know there are. I know when I sitting with my city council, there's actually debate on, on certain words or the sequence of the words and what you know what needs to be included and not included, or excluded. So it gets to that fine grain details um, and the mission statement as well, uh, and then the values. Um, so after all that, I think then we can put together, um, that may not be that, that day. And normally what I've done when, as part of what I, when I do, my, my strategic plans, after the, the round two of the vision, mission, oh, there's two mission there, and values, what I do is I take all that information because it's gonna take some time for whoever is writing the, uh, the strategic plan to take all that information in and really sort of reformulate, we, we define you to a certain degree and we allocate the themes out there. And you may even want to you know, help 
make the wordsmithing even more clearer, even smoother. And then you want to do that work because you're not going to be able to do that when you have 10, 15 people sitting around the room. And it's best to so we focus and do that behind the scene. And I would just suggest that you, you just take it, take it with you, develop the plan. Once you have the draft plan in place, then you would bring it back to your board, your membership, and your stakeholders. Uh, you may, as part of your, your discussion and draft discussion, you may want to invite the, your local director of recreation, parks and recreation to be part of your, your process or have them review your plan. You, if you have a you know, parks and recreation commission or committee out there, you may want to invite the chair and vice chair. You may even want to present the draft plan to them. Again, that's relationship building and communication. You will, you will let them know that you're working on this, this, this plan and you're proud of it. And we have a, a clear vision where we want to go as a club. And there may be other groups out there. You may want to touch base perhaps with, uh, if you really want, um, and maybe you want to build partnership with the Winter Club, who knows? Um, do they have any suggestion how to, how to create that synergy somehow? And, and, and then get all those comments back. And then once you have the, all the comments, then you want to make the adjustment amendment to the strategic plan and then finalize it and then off you go. Then you, you, you know, you're off to the races as they say. So that's really a very high overview of uh, strategic planning. Uh, any question before we circle back to the scenario that I pose at the beginning, then we'll, we'll try. I don't know if we can, uh, it's quite ambitious and uh, I probably need some help along the way in terms of uh, documenting and maybe um, some of the ideas and objectives and from, from the participants. But before I do that, um, any, any comments, questions? I'm gonna stop sharing now. One of the questions I had before was like, how long is the process? Like, but you, you went over that sort of the two day, but you know, Zoom and stuff, it could be, you know, a few meetings. Yeah. Long, I suppose evenings and such. Yeah, I mean, it all depends, right? Um, if you don't have a strategic plan, I think, you know, you probably want to allocate a couple of days. And after that, those two days, whoever is writing a strategic plan probably is going to take, depending on how much time they have, um, you know, it may take a week, couple of weeks or more than that to actually create that draft, draft plan. Once you have that draft plan in place, then you want the consultation, right? With your membership or key stakeholders, you know, depending on how that goes, that could be anywhere from a couple of weeks to, to a month time. And then after you do that, then you can then refine your plan based on the comments that you, you have received and then um, get it all set and done. Now, that's what, if you don't have a, you know, actual strategic plan. If you do have a strategic plan, what you may wanna think about, and this is what we have done, is that um, because of COVID, we want to be able to have a interim strategic plan to allow us to get over this COVID hump, if you will. Uh, again, because priorities change. I mean, you know, I don't know when um, we will be able to actually have competition again, even though the pool may be open and you are allowed, you'll be allowed to practice. I suspect that um, the province will probably not gonna be allowing um, public gathering to, to, have, to watch competition. So, and you know your financial outlook, how you train your athletes, um, and all that things, and financially, and, and all that stuff. You may want to just have a, a interim strategic plan, 
so that it get you to pa pass COVID. And then after COVID is over, then you may want to actually create your long-term three, four, five years strategic plan. Uh, in that case, if you're just only going to be looking at the interim, you can probably do that in half a day. Uh, really at that point, you're really looking at really your, your goals for the next year or so, how you can get through this um, and, and, and stay, stay afloat, to be quite honest. So hopefully that answers your questions. No question? Okay, so what I'll do is I'm gonna share my screen again. So here's the scenario. So based on what you heard so far, let's try to, I mean, does it resonate with anyone, what I put down here based on this scenario? Yes, no? Okay, so I, I don't wanna to get too ambitious. So let's try to create, um, I wanna hear what you, your ideas. I'm gonna, you can say it out loud and I'm gonna to try to type it in and then uh, see if we can create like a, a mini strategic plan, maybe with one or two key priorities and some tactics, see if that works. If not, if um, you think I <laughs> bored you long enough with my presentation, we can just end it right here. This, I'm, I'm, I'm a pleasure of you, you know, what you guys, what you guys want. I'm at the pleasure of you guys, what do you guys want? I think it'd be good to, to go through it at the start. I think that club, um, what you had out there is probably a lot of clubs dealing with low registration and, and issues. So I think it'd be good just to get us started with some brainstorming together. Okay. So let's go back to the strategic position. I can think of questions that I want to address as far as we'd be right now. You know, do we have a post COVID plan? That's, that's something that's further down the road. But then I think what all clubs we need to do right now, if they haven't already, is how are we going to get through the next four months? We don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but we still need to plan for it. Yeah, I think that's good, Danny. I think what, you know, instead of creating a strategic plan, I think it might be too ambitious. It's uh, maybe is to, like I said earlier, um, a interim one. How do you get past? Get, get us through the next four months. That might be more achievable. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, this, this could be an ideal time for your club. I think you need to do that, but then you could also be, you know, going back to point one, starting on your post COVID plan. Where are we going to go? How are we going to build the club once we're back in the water and once we can start uh, moving? Um, yeah, we have a hand raised. Yeah, Shane. I see Shane Hopkins has. Uh, either you muted or yes, we're not hearing you. Yeah, I, I, Danny, I think what's important, I think, you know, each club, I don't know if, if each club has been doing this or not, to your point, um, either the executive themselves or as, as the, you know, the members them, uh, together with the members is to have really a, a good discussion, a structured discussion, you know, what are we going to do, in, you know, the next four months? Um, what do we see ourselves as our priorities uh, over the next four months? Are we going to offer programs? Um, I know many of the pools are, you know, allowing practice, uh, but not comp competition. Um, how are we going to get us through this? Um, during this, and, and, and like I said earlier, we have this mini pause. I think it's 
important upon all of us to rethink how you conduct your business uh, as a club, as a, as a province, um, because things will change. There's no question uh, how we're going to be conducting our business uh, post COVID. There will probably going to be measures in place that may be more restrictive um, in terms of how people gather and, and how we do things. Um, and in terms of other sports, how was swimming going to be viewed um, upon against other sports out there like baseball, uh, hockey, and, and so on and so forth? How are you going to be attracting more competitors into your clubs? You know, how do you going to be make them feel comfortable of joining the swimming as opposed to baseball or hockey and, and so on and so forth? Um, and will the, will, you know, the, a lot of municipalities are having financial issues, and that's one of the primary reasons why they're not opening the indoor pools. You know, how are they going to be raising uh, the fees, pool fees, and how is the club going to be able to manage all that? Um, so th those are things that the club needs to start thinking about having some plan in place, not reactive, but proactive. And who do you need to talk to? You probably need to have some meetings with your, you know, manager of the pool, recreation, or who's in charge of the pool. You may want to start talking to some of your members of council and get some idea and, and build that relationship and build that, um, help lobby them to help support your clubs, either through grants or other financial means. Uh, maybe they can maybe uh, help you over the next three years or so, um, have a stop gap, a backstop mm -hmm. to help you get through the next three years without increasing mm -hmm. the fees and so on and so forth. So those are all the things that you need to start thinking about um, post COVID. And it's not gonna be just next year or this year. It's gonna be a couple of years down the road. So now's the time and once you post COVID then how you need to again what's going to change how's the world's going to change and what you, do you need to do and think about to make your club viable and competitive and attract the competitors against all the, the challenges out there locally regionally provincially federally and globally so sorry Shane you, you had your hands up <laughs> Can you hear me now? Now we yep. can hear you. Yay. Okay, great. Um, so first, Francis, a uh, great presentation. Um, our board, the North Vancouver Cruisers, uh, back in 2018 did uh, strategic planning as well. And we did five-year strategic plan in 2019. Uh, so we've, we've tried to uh, basically follow that as best we can. We haven't, renew we haven't renewed or done a brand new strategic plan specifically for COVID but we're trying to roll with the punches as best we can. Uh, we're uh, in North Vancouver, we had a complete closure because all of our pools are indoor and run by the <clears throat> uh, Municipal uh, Sports uh, Recreation Commission. So they shut everything down last summer. We moved online. This summer, we were, uh, or sorry, last winter, we were able to open uh, for winter maintenance, um, just a couple of sessions a week, yeah, much decreased from last year. And this summer, we're actually looking at doing as close to a normal summer as we can, minus all competitions. Um, what, what we're doing right now is we're currently in talks to have, um, because we have fewer practices for all sports, uh, I'm coming up with some ideas uh, and I'm floating this with uh, our new head coach uh, to come up with practices that would allow kids to try different disciplines within a speed practice. So we have four disciplines. Maybe we could do some drills with some water polo balls or like some synchro, uh, some synchro stuff and take it as an opportunity because there's less practice time maybe we can actually get kids involved in more sports so they can actually increase the total number of hours that they're able to do with the idea that we might eventually be able to regrow some of the sports that we've had a decrease in numbers over the last few years. Our artistic swimming and water polo have um, historically over the last five years really decreased in numbers. 
So I'm hoping that some kids will just be so interested in wanting to get into the pool that they'll actually be willing to try other sports. Now, I think long term, we have had to shut down our introduction program, which we called Splash, for basically non-swimmers because they'd be in the water with two coaches and a few volunteers. Mm -hmm. And we can't do that, unfortunately. So I think our club and any other clubs that um, have lost the ability to offer an introduction program might have difficulty over the next few years because the way that we have typically grown is to have those swimmers from the introduction program then join the competitive program when they're a little bit older. Um, we had an incident last, uh, last Saturday. Uh, we've had some uh, new sessions open up for April. A, a swimmer who the parents assured us was a very strong swimmer who had not been in the water since COVID started tried to join one of the, uh, one of the practices that was her level or as they believed to be her level. And she basically turned out to be a non-swimmer. She was not able to do the practice simply because she hasn't swum in the year. So I think we're also going to have to be really mindful of gently introducing kids back into the water um, and figuring out how to start or, or how to start regrowing the clubs when COVID ends. Mm -hmm. Anyway, those are my thoughts, thanks. No, those are all great points. And, you know, I, I you know, I, I don't know how the board thinks about that uh, in terms of there, there may be a time, uh, you know, like I said, you know, we have to look at everything with a fresh lens, you know, at this point and by how to attract the competitors back into the pool and, and swimming and so on and so forth. You know, some of the rules may need to be looked at um, for interim period where you may need to make some adjustment uh, to allow some of that competitors to to train more easily more accessible and so on and so forth um maybe just for the next foreseeable future post covid uh that's something that the board may need to think about uh, it's always interesting when we talk about you know those type of rules and and fairness and, and all but uh there are things right now that we're doing that we have never thought about doing and we're doing it because is, you know, to the long term, it might not be the right thing to do, but for the short term, uh, is what needs to be done to get us by. So uh, we're doing a lot of that right now. Um, it's just the way, the, how world, the whole world is, so. Yeah, something I'd, I'd toss out there too, uh, Francis, is you were, we're in a COVID requirement right now where the kids have to be three meters apart, but the hope is by late summer, things might be a lot more ordinary. And mm. so we're gonna, we're gonna see a lot of groups that just didn't operate over the summer. I know our soccer is not going to run up here this year as it ordinarily would. So mm -hmm. there might be a lot of kids that aren't in anything. And if all of a sudden restrictions get easier, you know, one thing we're looking at is we're gonna run swim camps for the public in August. Mm -hmm. Yes, that keeps our coaches employed, uh, gives them more hours, and that's a way to attract more people to our sport and bring those those beginner levels in so that they're ready to join us next year. So uh, that's where short term planning comes in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, now's the opportunity to think and plan how you can attract, you know, like you said, you know, other sports may not be operating. And how do you bring those kids to swimming? And that's a great strategy. Can I, um, can I jump in uh, just on strategizing? There have now been two independent uh, studies published, one by uh, Swim Alberta, I believe, and another one um, in the United Kingdom saying that uh, COVID, there have been no reported cases in either of these studies um, of COVID cases in swimming pools, whether athlete to athlete, coach to athlete, or coach to coach. Uh, so that Alberta study was published in the CMAJ, the Canadian, um, uh, or, uh, Canadian Medical Association Journal, and the United Kingdom. Um, uh, that was a study that actually found that COVID dies within 30 seconds of exposure to chlorine. Are we planning on doing any BCSSA 
um, I almost want to say lobbying, but I know there are rules against that, um, a promotion of swimming, uh, maybe to municipalities and local governments, because swimming seems at this point to have a very, very safe environment where COVID does not really thrive. So if, if other sports are not happening, um, I think municipalities really need to be offering swimming as an option. I think municipalities know about that. Uh, we have been keeping fairly close watch and that's one of the reasons why um, our, our pools are open. I think what it comes down to where when, you know, like I said earlier, where pools are, are closed are because of revenue, uh, because they're not running full capacity. They're not getting the revenue that normally gets generated from uh, running an indoor pool. And that gets into union issue, wages issues, layoff issues. It's not just closing the pool. There's a cascading effect um, by shutting down a pool. So I know from speaking to my uh, director of uh, recreation who will see the pools, they're fully aware of uh, that there's not a strong link or any link uh, of uh, COVID related spread uh, at pool because like you said, uh, the chlorine kills the, the virus. So I think we're all aware that it's more from an economic perspective. That's what's keeping the pools closed at this point. But that's a good point. Catherine, did you have a question? Your mic's open. I sure did. Um, I'd like to go back to that public swim conversation. Um, when did or do you run that? We... we and so we haven't yet. This is an idea we're bouncing around to run in August. Uh, we already know we're not going to have an in-person provincials or an in-person regionals. We're looking how long can we realistically run a training season for our swimmers until they just have had it. They don't want to train anymore because they're not getting to compete. And we don't really want to turn our coaches loose, you know, at the beginning of August and say, well, thanks for the three months and you're not gonna make any money for the last month before you go back to school. So we're looking at running swim camps where the public could register for them. They'd be a learn to competitive swim kind of thing. And uh, they one or two water sessions a day and then dry land sessions and introduce them to our sport, uh, get them sort of committed, set the hook, so to speak, so that they might enroll either in our winter maintenance program or uh, enroll next May. Now, do you do you run out of a complex or an outdoor pool? Ours is an indoor pool. So would you have problems with the indoor pool who actually have swimming lessons running? Like, would they allow you to do that or? Well, we're not gonna call this swimming lessons. Well, this, this would just be a competitive swim camp. Competitive swim camp. Yeah. Hosted and... by our, it would be under the name of our club. Um, have you guys discussed pricing for that? Not with the city. Uh, we're thinking we'll probably get the same pricing we do for our training sessions right now. And, and we would just use the training sessions that we already have booked. See, my brain just went not for August, but we have a lot of spots on our registration right now for May 1st that are empty and we're, it's a little bit of a sad, scary site at the moment. And I think this would be a great opportunity to do before our summer swimming starts to see if um, we could get more interest and um, where, if we could put them into the developmental area for July and August, cause we're only doing developmental for starting July. I, that my head is exploding. Yeah. This is amazing. Good, good idea to pursue. The one problem you have is they have to be three meters apart when they're in the water. So can you put enough in the water to make it financially viable? Yeah, I hate to jump in, but the session has to end because another one has to open. But um, Catherine, if you want to connect with Danny over those ideas for sure. Um, I do want to thank Francis for offering us this session and uh, thank those people who stuck around to the end. Uh, good ideas. <laughs> I mean, it's really important to be planning even short-term and thinking long-term. So really appreciate that, Francis. Thank you. Thank you very Everybody. much, Francis. Okay. See you again. Yeah, you bet. Thank you.